All right. Well, here we are um, for our, I guess, second of the summer. Um, show me the open science Twitch stream. I'm Sheila Saya. Um, I work at the state climate office. Uh, in North Carolina on Centennial Campus at NC State. And I'm going to do some introductions because we have some new faces. Um, and also let Micah, I'll just pass it to Micah and then Micah, you can pass it back to me. So I'll let you introduce yourself, Micah. Sure. Good to see you again, Sheila, and welcome to our guests. And hello to anyone uh, watching now or later. Uh, my name is Micah Vandegrift. I'm the Open Knowledge Librarian at NC State University Libraries and a uh, proud co-host to my friend and partner, Sheila. Go ahead, Sheila. All right, so we have two awesome guests today, uh, Dr. Natalie Nelson, who's a professor and the lead of the Biosystems Analytics Lab in the Department of Bio and Ag Engineering at NC State. Um, and she's gonna tell you a little bit more about what she does or what she, you know, especially wants to highlight in terms of research, but overall she uses data analytics and machine learning to study complex biological systems dynamics um, in lots of different applications. I was specifically collaborating with her on an aquaculture project, but she does a lot of other um, projects uh, regarding biological systems. So. That's Natalie. And then next we have Sierra, Dr. Sierra Young, who is also a professor. Um, and she's also the lead of the digital uh, agroecology and in intelligent systems lab or DAISY lab for short um, in the Department of Bio and Ag Engineering at NC State. Uh, and she develops human-centered robots and sensors that help monitor agricultural systems and natural processes. So I'm going to give her a chance to explain what she especially likes about that research. Um, and also, I wanted to give a big shout out to Claire, who is our moderator today. So thanks, Claire, for doing all you do to get this Twitch stream up and running smoothly and for moderating in the chat. So thanks for that. Um, and so I guess the first thing I'm going to pass it back to Micah. Can you tell us a little bit about reproducibility and why we have these chats? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, um, ran randomly in the in the big wide world of open science, uh, I came across a, an initiative at Oxford University, uh, or started at Oxford University now all around the globe um, for your clubs, people discussing topics in open science and reproducibility. Um, and then, of course, there's the, the tea, drinking tea uh, end of that, um, that, that program. So uh, I was really inspired by it. I thought it'd be a good thing to bring to NC State. We were looking for ways to do creative and exciting things when we've all been home and looking at this green dot at the top of my computer for last year and a half. Uh, so this was uh, one idea that we had. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're glad to continue doing it. and. Uh, um, it's been really fun. Awesome. Yeah. And yeah. And so we also have a GitHub page where we're kind of like keeping track of all the reproducibility um, chats that we have. And um, I'm going to ask Claire to put that in the chat. It is in the Zoom chat, Claire. So if you could add that to the chat and people can follow along. Um, so I guess the first question you know, back to the tea chat, because we have to chat about tea and reproducibility. So I guess the question for Nali and Sierra is like, do you like tea? Are you a tea drinker? Um, which tea do you like? So Nali, do you want to go first? Yeah, I like all kinds of tea. <laughs> um, pretty much everything. I guess I haven't met a tea that I didn't like. Yeah, and thanks for the invite to participate in this today. What about you, Sierra? Yeah, I'm going to second that. Big tea drinker. Don't really have a huge preference, although I like sleepy time at night. Um, sleepy time tea. <laughs> although I think I'm a terrible tea drinker because I always let it steep way too long into like awful scalding water, way hotter than you're supposed to, but still drink it anyway. Yeah, sleepy time is definitely a classic. Um, like before bed tea for me too. Yeah, I was wondering about um, like this is gonna sound weird when I say it, tea, tea paraphernalia. Like, 
do I need to have a, uh, like a, a thermometer to get the exact right temperature? And like, um, lately we've been, we've been brewing tea. We have two, two little kids who are getting into hot tea now in the middle of summer in the U S for some reason. Um, and so we like put something on top of the, the mug to let it steep a little better or something. But I know they make like real things you can do that you can use to put on top of the mug. I'm like, at what point should we be purchasing more tea paraphernalia? I don't know. It doesn't seem like we uh, drink it enough, but I don't know. Now we're what, seven months into a stream about it where we talk about it once a month. Maybe I need some stuff. Well, they do have a lot of those really cute, like I'm just thinking I have, I just remembered I had this because I was going through my tea cabinet the other day. <laughs> and I have like this little manatee because I manatees like growing up were like one of my favorite animals. I don't know how <laughs> I think my grandparents lived in Florida growing up and um, they like I just like fell in love with manatees when I went to visit there. So I have this manatee and it like the it's like um shoulders and head come off and you can like put tea in there and then it like it, it has like these arms that like kind of like dangle and you can rest the arms on the mug so it's like it's like taking a bath in your tea it's really cute so yeah i feel like kids would like stuff like that so maybe yeah. you could get them one of those that sounds cool and then i still um Sierra and Natalie, I don't know if you've gone back and caught up on the entire series of open science and reproducibility, but I, I randomly somehow uh, started collecting um, a thing called tea, tea mugs. Have you ever seen these? Where like the there's or it's a, a mustache cup where there's like a little um, lip on the inside of the cup where like in old times men had big mustaches and they would drink, but the the holder on the inside of the the lip of the cup would catch your mustache to keep it out of. Anyway. I, I told Sheila I was going to send her one, and I haven't yet, so I still need to find one. I, I'm going to find the perfect one for you, Sheila. I'll, I'll look around for it. Oh. <laughs> yeah. It's funny that you say that because I have a mug like that. I didn't know it was for mustaches. I, we had found it at my grandma's house, and uh, she let me have it, and we've always been wondering, like, what's with this little <laughs> shelf in the mug? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I think I'm... I'm sure there's an official name for it. I've never looked them up on, on Wikipedia or whatever, but I have a few of them somehow. I, I've i also seen where they have like a pocket. It's not just a shelf. It's like, and that's for, I thought that was for like the tea bag. Oh, I have one of those. It's like a little, mine's like a cat and like the body back is the tea mug and that's little face. Like it's like a smaller little separate compartment in the front of the mug. And I think... Yeah, you're supposed to put a tea bag or something in there. Oh, brilliant. And you don't do that, Sierra, because you let it. Tea. Yeah, no, I just let it see if it's like I'm drinking it, and it's like way it too bitter and strong. <laughs> She, I feel like at some point we should get a we should actually get a tea expert to come and talk to us about this kind of stuff. We we were close. We had a a friend of mine and a guest a couple of months ago named Cassidy Sugimoto, who's a professor of information science, and she like logged in. We're saying we're like, hey, we're drinking chai, and she went rattled off a bunch of things that I have never heard of. She like described her entire day in tea, and I was like, all right, you you win. We're really failing at, at this. Um, so we're novices, yeah. <laughs> Well, but, we're, but we're good at streaming. Go ahead, Sheila, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I guess like in to go along with the theme for today. So, so I guess to give the Twitch stream some context. So, um, Micah, Natalie, Sierra, I, and a web developer um, who isn't able to join us today, um, you know, are working on writing this. 10, it's a 10 simple rules collection paper, and this collection is part of uh, PLOS, so I can never remember what that stands for, Public, Public Library, Library of Science. Of Science? Yeah. Okay. Um, for computational biology, they have a special collection uh, called 10 simple rules, and so we have been working on getting a paper submitted to this scientific journal. Um, and the paper outlines 10 simple rules for researchers who want to develop web apps. And so uh, we, you know, convened, Natalie and I convened all these um, 
awesome people to help us write this paper um, after an experience we had developing an open source web app. So that kind of ties into reproducibility. So I guess to get back to one last T question, um, did you all have like some simple rules that you wanted to share like about how you make tea or you know what you like to do regarding your tea uh yeah like how you make tea or tea tea atmosphere in your house you know something like that yeah Well, uh, I really don't know much about the technique of making good tea, but I remember reading one time, it was some, I think, blog post or something uh, where someone who was from England was kind of criticizing the way Americans drink tea. And one thing that had stuck with me is they mentioned that you should always brew fresh water. So I tend, I have a tea kettle and I tend to just push, you know, oil and then I pour it and I keep going until it runs out. Uh, and so now I try to make an effort to use fresh water each time. <laughs> but then otherwise, uh, what I'm doing, I think, is really plain Jane. Yeah, same. Unfortunately, I I can't say I follow the tea etiquette rules, um, but we have gotten in a habit of less now that it's like 100 degrees in the middle of the afternoon and evening, but normally just at the end of the day is like the very last thing just my spouse and I sitting down, having a cup of tea to just like close out the day. And that's kind of, it means the day is over. We've shut our laptops, we're relaxing, the TV's off. So that's kind of a nice like routine, I guess, since we've been home so much in the last year to kind of separate and shut things down for the, for the night. That's a really good idea. Yeah. Yeah, that, that sounds really nice. My, my one simple rule, Sierra, I learned this in the last in the last year is don't let's tea too long. <laughs> it actually, I, I've started paying attention to like the suggested steeping time and the tea tastes better and I like it more and that's cool. So that's my one simple rule. <laughs> oh, it's funny because I realized I was doing that. My my partner's in the Netherlands and the first time I like met all his friends, you're at one of their houses and they were like, they just, as soon as you walk in, they're like, coffee, tea, what do you want? Like, here's a beverage. And I was like, oh, tea, I already had too much coffee. But they set down tea and then they gave they were like set the little dish like it was just part of it and I'm like I don't even own one of these like it's so hard and I was like oh yeah I'm supposed to take my tea bag out and like out of the tea and do that so I did purchase um while we were there a few little tea bag trades a couple of years ago so I need to, yeah get in the habit of using those yeah baby steps yeah <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess I don't really know of any simple rules, but I guess I like to ha I have like a tea corner in my kitchen. So because I don't drink coffee, I just drink tea. So um, my partner has his like coffee corner and then I have my like tea corner. So I have like, you know, the hot water heater and like the little um, like ceramic container where I put like my tea bags that I did for English breakfast. So it's my favorite breakfast tea. <laughs> Yeah, it's good to have that routine for sure. Close beginning and closing the day with tea. <laughs> all right. Well, we have a bunch of questions. Um, I don't know if we'll get through them all, but um, yeah. So this is just we're just kind of going to go through these questions, and they're with regards to this ten simple rules paper that we've been working on, and we have a deadline to resubmit that uh, for. Um, review coming up. So we've all been thinking a lot about that as we work through the revision. So I guess, the, but I guess um, I did like give you a little bit of an introduction, to, like what Sierra and Natalie are working on, but is there something specifically related to like open science or reproducibility uh, that you wanted to like highlight uh, in the research that you do? I'll let you go first, Natalie. Well, I think the main open science project that I've been involved with is the one that we'll be talking about a little bit today as well. Um, so it's called Shellcast. Is now a good time to introduce it? Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. Okay. So um, like Sheila mentioned before, what I'm focused on is mostly using data analytics and models. And it's typically to uh, predict how environmental and agricultural systems are going to change. So that change might be in the next few days, could be over a couple of decades, but that's generally what my lab is focused on. 
And in the case of shell casts, uh, we're trying to predict the likelihood that areas in which shellfish growers produce shellfish might experience a temporary harvest closure. So basically after large storm events, you have a lot of stormwater runoff and that runoff can carry different types of fecal matter and other bacteria sources into coastal waters. And because uh, shellfish are filter feeders, they take up the water around them and they feed from it, they sometimes end up ingesting that bacteria, which doesn't hurt them, but it can hurt then people who go and eat those shellfish afterwards, especially um, since oysters, for example, are often eaten raw on the half shell. And so to prevent that type of contamination from occurring after fairly large storm events, regulators will close down waters where shellfish are grown and they'll say no harvest is allowed. Um, and so what the way that process works is basically they issue these um, declarations that the waters are closed until further notice. And so what we wanted to do is create a tool that would help growers to predict when those closures might occur. So we use uh, national weather forecast information to then estimate what the likelihood is of these different areas along the coast having potential contamination issues. And we disseminate that information through a web application. Also for people who make accounts through the web application, they can get notifications. Um, and so this work is funded through North Carolina Sea Grant and like with federal uh, offices, any work that they support is supposed to be fully open. And so fortunately, we were also able to recruit Sheila on that project and she brought a lot of her um, knowledge and prior experience on open science to the project such that we could implement what I think are a lot of the best practices uh, related to open science as we develop that project. So that's been I, I was introduced to open science and reproducibility in grad school. I don't remember exactly when or who had introduced me to it, but um, I had attended, I think, some workshops that uh, introduced the subject. And I did a little bit in grad school, like including code and supplements. But I think that really the first time that I did this in a, a very meaningful way was with Sheila on the Shellcast project. Yeah, it's been a really fun project. Thanks for explaining all that too. Um, I'll pass it to Sierra. So is there anything yeah, in particular that you've worked on with regards to open science or reproducibility that you wanted to highlight? Yeah. Yeah, sure, thanks. So kind of similar to Natalie's experience, I had, I guess, dabbled a bit in it as a graduate student, but it was never really the central kind of focus of the project where the whole thing start to finish was in this open science kind of um, framework. But as, as far as my research goes, I'm more on the robotics and sensing technology aspect of a lot of this work. So a lot of what I do is kind of develop new kind of technologies or modify existing platforms um, including developing autonomy or making different sensor packages. And in that, um, really kind of focusing on the open kind of tech communities. So relying a lot on things like Arduinos to develop kind of sensors and putting that code. Um, I mean, I've done stuff where well, usually what we do, we put it on GitHub, but I haven't, I need to be better about kind of putting full documentation with that. But um, and now working kind of when some of these robotics projects actually Natalie and I are um, co-investigators on a robotics project with a focus on aquaculture. So using some of these platforms to collect water samples and kind of gather more data um, more quickly to make better decisions when we can open these harvest areas again and also use some of these data to improve some of Natalie's modeling efforts. Um, and in that, developing some of these platforms using entirely open source robotics software relying heavily on code that others have built, modifying, adapting that, making our modifications publicly available and kind of really adopting that open framework. So, um, you know, I think that helps enable what we do and building new sensing platforms kind of iteratively makes that process much shorter. And hopefully when we share what we've done, it shortens that process um, further for other folks hoping to do things in this kind of sensor and robotics technology space. So, and then of course, working with folks like you and Natalie to make the data that we collect from all these platforms kind of integrate in with some of these other efforts um, on the, the data side. Yeah. Yeah, cool. And Micah, did you want to read the question from the chat or do you so, think? So yeah. many ideas. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, we, we, we have a Zoom chat, so I'm like just leaving my ideas in there and our 
viewers and listeners on Twitch can't see that. Anyway, um, I, I'm fascinated. So like the the flavor of open science that I'm most familiar with and working in is almost entirely in the research publication space, which is where we'll get and why we're all in this room together. Um, open access publishing, sharing of open data, um, a little less in, in open education, um, open pedagogy. But the, the two things that, that Natalie, you and Sierra both mentioned, I think sort of represent the, the next horizon for open science, which is really around the areas that I'm reading and seeing called open uh, open source software, which we all sort of have an understanding of and we can get to talking about Shellcast and open hardware. So I wanted to turn a, a question to Sierra, Are, is, is open hardware um, something that's being talked about in, in your corner of, um, of of the world and then what do you think about that idea is the is the horizon really software and hardware yeah that's a really great question and so i think my experience and what i've seen is that there's starting to be a lot more of this kind of open reproducible hardware um being valued and where now there's um you know journals hardware x where you can publish you know essentially publishing a data so you're publishing how you built this here's some examples of the um hardware being deployed completely with their diagrams stl files basically you can publish this and then other research groups or really anyone can take all of these design files and things and reconstruct um something that you've validated and now there's whole research labs um, built around this concept. Um, it's definitely something that I and my, you know, research group use, um, but there's labs that definitely take this to a really ex excellent level. Um, there's a group at Oregon State that does this and they have this whole page and they have all these projects and armies of, you know, 20, 30 graduate students working on these in teams every semester and it's kind of amazing and I think they're really at like the forefront of this true reproducible kind of hardware development, which I think is really, really neat. So um, yeah, some of these things are working on now, once they're farther along, I definitely am interested in, you know, dabbling into putting some of those hardware focused open hardware design papers out kind of in addition to maybe a more typical peer reviewed paper to kind of keep building in that open hardware space. I think it's really um, gonna become really important too. What is the name of the group at Oregon State? I'm gonna look it up. I don't wanna give you the wrong name. I'll put the link in the chat. Okay, cool. Great, yeah, then Claire could share that. Any other follow-up questions, Micah, from you or the chat? So many, yes. Um, okay, I'll let you take it away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just so cu curious, because this is something I know not so much about. Um, and then I'll try to tie it back to, to the to the paper and co-authorship. So we, um, some of the work that I'm doing is about incentives, right? Early career researchers, C Sierra, your assistant professor, Natalie, assistant professor. Yeah. So early uh, early career researchers, the, the, the most significant challenge that we hear and see in incentivizing open science work, whatever is underneath that, um, is that it doesn't count. Right? unless there's a publication attached to it in a, in a high impact journal, it doesn't count. Um, if, for example, three to five years from now, open source software and open hardware are more central to the advancements of your work, how do you think you can find ways to make it count? And I'm, I'm just so you know, I'm doing my work on, on, on my side also to make it possible for you, but I'm really curious because you're you're actually in the middle of it. I'm I'm on the outside. Well, Sierra, I wonder if maybe talking about the role of extension, because one thing that I think is so Sierra also has a part extension appointment um, and in an extension, there's way more recognition of broader ways of making impact beyond just producing publications. I'm going to chew on your question for a little bit and punt to Sierra, but I do think the extension angle um, is worth exploring in the discussion. Yeah, that's a that's a good point about extension. I mean, I think if you can kind of take these, whether it's software, hardware, tools, data, and turn them into kind of a product that others can use um, and maybe trying to quantify that in some way, whether it's kind of um, downloads or users and kind of maybe who, if someone's using this to make a decision or implementing it in their workflow, 
um, that is a kind of direct measurable impact of research that's conducted within the university that is very directly related to the mission of extension and now unfortunately extension is not and everyone has those appointments and it's definitely more common in bio and ag engineering departments um, so that's i'm not sure that's the avenue for everyone but i do think it's still part of at least land grant universities even if you don't have an extension appointment to kind of point to that and say you're contributing to the overall mission of some of these universities and um you know i do i kind of was looking up this like the opens lab um which i put a link in the the chat um and i think they have a really nice model where they do develop these open you know, hardware projects and things like that. And then they also always deploy them with collaborators, with other folks to gather new data to answer, you know, there's always a science question, right? You're not gonna develop something just for the sake of doing it usually in, in research. I mean, sometimes it's fun to do that, but there's usually a driving kind of question or some science, um, you know, something you're trying to learn from developing, at least in the context of like hardware, sensing hardware. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of times that might happen in, in parallel. Yeah, and one thing that also um, dawned on me through this discussion is, I think that also developing tools, if it's something that you want to do, like if you want to develop, say, software, other types of um, tools that people can use, it's important to be able to demonstrate that you've done it before with some success, right? So. I think there's also just incentive and in if you want to work in that area, you have to be able to point to a kind of portfolio that you have. Um, and so I can think of examples where I was on review committees where we're looking at proposals, for example, and um, sometimes there's just a little bit of skepticism that perhaps a certain team knows how to go about producing software or hardware that has impact that will actually be used by others. Um, and so I think one really strong incentive is if you have something that you can use to demonstrate what you're capable of, then it opens, I think, additional doors. But like a formal incentive for a tenure dossier, that's a little bit trickier. And all I can think of is in my dossier, there is this section on extension and community outreach, where even though I don't have an extension appointment, there's more flexibility with what you can list there in terms of the products you prepare and some justification of what the, the impact is, who the users are, who, is, who are the stakeholders. Um, and so with that flexibility, there's some opportunity to kind of brag about what you do in those areas. Yeah, and I, I mean, I've also heard of, like, I know, you know, like in the art, coding community like there are lots of researchers there that are developing for example like our um like function libraries for a specific specific theme um of analysis or you know you name it like generating art like everything so i feel like those folks also um it's interesting to see like yeah how they like I'm just thinking of one in particular, um, Kyle Walker, who developed the tidy census package for R. So that is interfacing with the US Census Bureau's API to get census data um, and pull that directly into R sessions. And I know like, you know, he is writing books and giving trainings and things like that. So I think, yeah, for, it'll be interesting to see like, um, as people sort of start to branch out and do more of these types of work and not just like focus on publications, how dossiers maybe evolve or 10 year evaluations evolve. I'm hoping that they will, uh, to, if, you know, cause these, this is a lot of work like doing these things. So, um, yeah, well, I just, I kind of wanted to take a little bit of a step back. I think that's like a great discussion about open software and open hardware, but I do want to kind of explain like what the 10 simple rules that kind of we came up with. Um, and so, and then maybe have some discussion about those, like if you have a favorite one or most surprising one or uh, things like that. So I wish I could share my screen at this point, but maybe the best thing is if Claire could just copy paste those into the chat and I, I can just kind of read them off briefly. Um, so the 10, and also Claire, if you wouldn't mind putting the, uh, 
Earth Archive preprint in there too. That would be awesome. Um, so yeah, so for the 10 simple rules, so the preprint that's up there now hasn't incorporated some of the most recent changes that we're making for resubmission. So I'm gonna share just the updated version here now. But so the first rule we had was start with user-centered design. Um, and that was brought to us by Sierra because she does a lot of work um, with user-centered design. And then the second was test, test, and test again. So basically revolving around, you know, making sure your app is doing what you want it to do um, and that the users are getting um, what they want to out of the app. Um, and then the third is make it accessible and that we're specifically referring to uh, the ability for um, folks with disabilities to access the app that you create through screen readers or other assisted, assistive technologies. Um, and then the fourth was protect your users. So this kind of gets at you know, security, web security, um, modern web security, and how you how you plan for that. Um, the fifth was hire a web developer or become one. So we, for Shellcast, we ended up hiring a web developer, but there are a lot of other platforms out there, like we talked about R, so R Shiny apps or Esri Story Maps, there's like Tableau, that, those types of things um, that allow folks to explore results of your scientific work. Um, and then the sixth was expect expenses, where we kind of talked a little bit about how you outline, you know, expenses that you will, that will come up in the project um, and what that means for, like we gave an example of Shellcast and how we kind of navigated that, even though we're novices and can't really, it's hard to anticipate everything. Um, the seventh was leverage institutional expertise. And this is where people like Micah come in uh, to kind of help us get a better idea of like what is out there, what tools that we can use um, that, that the university is already providing. So for Shellcast, for example, we used uh, Google App Engine because at NC State, we use like the Google Suite. So we had access to that. Um, the eighth one was to track your progress with existing collaboration tools. So we talk a lot about Git here in the past few months. So stuff like that, um, doing project management to stay on track. And then what that means for open source too. Um, and then nine is estimating test times and then doubling them. So how, how you estimate test times. And then that kind of also loops back to like estimating costs too. Um, and planning ahead. And then the last one, uh, but not the least, was make it last and planning for the long haul. So basically, you know, how do you plan for sustainability and longevity when you're creating a web app? So I just kind of wanted to give a little bit of a overview of those so people know where we're coming from. They can see the Earth Archive preprint and eventually, hopefully, it gets accepted into PLOS computational biology, fingers crossed. Um, and folks can read it there. Um, so I guess the first question I had was like, do you all have a favorite rule? Or if not, like why? Or if you do, why? <laughs> so uh, Sierra, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, so I am, of course, biased. I have my, my favorite rule is rule number one, only because that resonates very closely with um, work that I've done and kind of what I've seen from kind of this technology and ag space where rule one is focused on um, starting with user and task centered design. And so this is actually like developing usable interfaces for new types of drones was kind of a big thrust of my um, dissertation work. And it was something where um, I really learned a lot. And I think kind of no matter what you do if you're working and trying to deliver some kind of product i think the user i mean it definitely is a well-known thing for kind of interface design app design right there's this whole thing about user testing i think it gets left out a little bit more for maybe like robotics and sensors and things like that so um i like to keep that kind of at the center and keep that at least in mind even if it's not the focus um 
of the, the project. And of course, I definitely resonate with the rule about estimating task times, doubling them, and then some, because I always just chronically underestimate the amount of time it takes me to do everything in life. So I should probably think about that rule a little bit longer or a little bit more. <laughs> Yeah, that one is so, yeah, it's so tricky. I feel like still I am, uh, it's so hard to navigate, like, navigate. Sorry, Google, for saying this. Sorry, not sorry. But it's really hard to navigate, like, all of this, like, cost and time estimates, like, for that platform. And I can't imagine other platforms are either, <laughs> but maybe they are. Um, but Micah, do you want to take a go? Do you have a favorite rule so far? Um, yeah, sure. Um, like Sierra, all my favorite rules are the ones that apply to me. <laughs> um, so, th but this was a really interesting process because so, um, and I'm learning a lot about scientific publishing, being involved in this with you all, because I was not involved at all in the development of the Shellcast project or the app, but, and these are the, the two rules um, where I did connect. Well, you did, um, you did give us feedback on our documentation. That's true, but so, so that's, <laughs> that's, um, that's leveraging institutional expertise. That's number seven. And then planning for sustainability, which for me, I, I've been reading a lot about um, maintainers, maintenance, uh, uh, infrastructure, those sorts of things. And sustainability is something that we don't really talk about in, in higher ed because we're, we're always moving to the next thing, which is valuable and we, we should do that. Um, um, but uh, there are ways, especially for this kind of a thing, developing a new piece of software based on or built from research um, that we can not ensure sustainability, but we can plan for some form of sustainability uh, and maintenance, especially where there are users that could really, that do and will and could and um, continue to benefit from something like Shellcast. So um, it's been intriguing for me to watch how writing happens in, in, in y'all's discipline um, and participate in that um, and add little bits where I can. I was trying to pull up, I was working on the paper last night and found a really cool uh, article. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll put it in the chat in a second, but it was, there are other people who are researching some questions that we came up with in the middle of the writing of the 10 simple rules, like um, how to estimate um, time for developing research-based web apps. Uh, so I'll find that uh, in a second and post it in the chat. Natalie, do you want to share your favorite yeah. rule? Favorite? So I think my favorite one is the last one, rule number 10, about making it last for the long haul. Um, and I think it's my favorite because that's really, it's really difficult to do, and it's not really uh, well supported through a typical research funding cycle. So we tend to get projects that are two to five years in duration. And often in your proposal, you have to explain how you're going to make the app last beyond the duration of the grant. And it's a really hard thing to come up with. It's difficult to come up with those plans uh, because there aren't clear mechanisms for funding these types of things. So the reason why I like that rule is that I think it helps to kind of walk through important considerations uh, and trying to keep that top of mind so that it doesn't become so much of an afterthought that you end up finding that your app doesn't live once your funding goes away. Yeah, can I, can I jump in real quick? So, so there's a there's a concept um, that is the title of a, a book from a humanities professor called Planned Obsolescence that I that I, I love the, the concept um, that and we, we talk about it. So another area of work that I'm involved in is what we call digital humanities. So there's a long conversation in digital humanities about um, yeah, I want to build a thing that will allow, you know, people on the internet to um, read Francis Bacon's work in a new way, right? Or, or kind of illuminate the uh, the ideas or, or make a visualization, those sorts of things. But I know that my, my work, my research will progress and move on from that topic or deepen and, and move in different ways. And so that web thing that I made about Francis Bacon will degrade. And so some of the, the ideas behind plan obsolescence and, um, and the 
uh, continued impact of that that book and the idea um, is just let, let's just be clear about that. This is the thing that we've built for now that is is valuable and and sustained in some way and maintained in some way now. And we talk about involving a user community as a maintenance strategy, which I think is is great. Um, and then there's an there's an end date. Like the the web technologies will will change, um, and either we uh, you know find ways to fund open source um, uh, research support, uh, or we have to say, hey, Shellcast was great from 2020 to 2030, and then the hurricanes overtook everything, and you know Wilmington's underwater. Um, but the uh, the the app worked. Uh, for this amount of time. So we had a maintenance and sustainability strategy, um, but planning for it to degrade, which is sad because this is this is work. This is good work. It impacts people, you know. An interesting yeah. point, maybe a tough sell <laughs> to certain sponsors. Yeah, no sponsor wants to hear you say that, but that, that's the truth of, of web technology. So, so some of the um, uh, one of the things we added into one of the rules, I don't remember which one it is. It might be the um, yeah, it might be the sustainability one, number 10, um, is that there are very new and recent funding mechanisms that are starting to realize that and say, okay, if we really want R to continue to be a thing into the future, we need to fund not just the tool and the software, but the people uh, that, that maintain it, add new things, uh, keep it alive. Yeah, you brought up a good point, Natalie, like balancing that, you know, what the sponsor wants, like is looking for and what is like realistic can be tricky sometimes. Yeah. Um, and I think like I, I got the impression from our reviewers that like this is something that they are also dealing with and like very interested in too. So that was it was helpful to hear like their input too on that uh, maintenance section and also you know they're asking us to really emphasize like maybe earlier on in the manuscript you know does this web app even need to exist or could you add to other app web apps that are already existing so I think yeah I, I also liked the fact of like the considerations that we're bringing up in the manuscript that is helpful I think at least helpful for me <laughs> so um moving forward with projects uh, yeah, I think my favorite rule, um, I mean, I really love all of them. So this is like a hard thing. And I also, I forgot to mention this, but they're not like steps. So we didn't intend them to be like, first you do user-centered design and then you test and then you make your app accessible. Um, so I, they're definitely like meant to be looked like as a holistic, um, like some holistic rules rather than just like do this and then do that and then do that. Yeah, I've, um, I've I, thought of them as principles. Principles yeah. is the word that I have in my head, yeah. I like that, I like that. Yeah, and my favorite one is definitely the third one, which is um, making your web app accessible because I think that one is the one I really like learned the most over the course of this project um of shellcast so i had never actually even considered you know like how a screen reader looks at a particular web app and so it was really cool to learn about like both the legislation and uh you know basically rules and um guidance that are offered you know through the u.s government but also like through our own university surrounding you know what our best practices for that. And it was great to talk to the Office of Information Technology staff who are like experts in that topic and, and learn about tools that like researchers can use to check to see if screen readers will have issues with the web app or even thinking about, you know, going through and brainstorming, like taking our mock-ups for Shellcast, which are these like before we started, you know, coding up the actual web app, we kind of had this like visual plan for like what the web app would look like and how how users would use it. And so taking that document 
about those mock-ups to the OIT staff and saying like, you know, what do you think? Is there anything we can do to change this to make it more accessible? So that whole process was like very new to me and I definitely learned a lot and I really appreciated the time that the OIT staff spent answering all my questions. <laughs> so um, yeah, so I guess when you all like were working on, so I'm thinking about shell crabs when I, I'm thinking about this question, but like, you know, Sierra, maybe some of your open hardware projects or other open source software projects and Natalie, maybe shell cast or maybe some other projects you're working on moving forward. Like, I guess what was one of the most surprising things to you in terms of like thinking about open, open source and like web apps? And also, Mike, you're welcome to share, like, you know, your experiences with us and other folks that you've interacted with in this arena. Does anybody want to go first or I can call you out? <laughs> yeah, it's, a, I mean, it's a tough question. So I feel like I'm always, always learning whenever I try to do something different or try to, you know, take what we're doing and, you know, put that kind of information or code or something out there it um i guess what surprised me is there's not i guess it's kind of also goes with why we wrote a 10 simple rules paper is that no i've never sat down in a class and had someone teach me principles of reproducible research or open science like that wasn't a course i took in grad school to you know maybe that that's changing and hopefully um it is but i guess it's definitely up to at least in my experience um you know up to the researcher and you to make sure that your work is reproducible and open which um you know it's just been i guess surprise something i'm learning is definitely like navigating this process because i think back to some projects that i did in graduate school where we did something really cool we built this new platform we did this field work we published a paper and those projects definitely died when the people left the institution like that knowledge um is gone if you don't put it out there in that space and there's definitely like projects i worked on in the past where that has happened and so i guess yeah i don't know if it's surprising or just things i've learned is definitely kind of how to even go about this in the first place and definitely kind of the initiative has really starts with kind of you and your research group and i am excited even events like this like I, I think it'd be cool to kind of incorporate this in like graduate programs and kind of have it be more formally taught like these principles about reproducible work because now um there are you know these are becoming more documented and things like that so that's kind of been my surprise or experience kind of going about this um as kind of a, the pi of a, of a research group now on the other side Sierra, just just so you know, my my secret agenda is to to make that a thing at, at, at universities, and th there are um, lots of supportive informal groups at lots of universities around the world that that do exactly what you just described. Um, our our public science cluster here at NC State does some of of that sort of stuff, and um, uh, yeah, loved learning from them. But I think there's more that that we can do. So that's my secret yeah, agenda. To be like. I don't know, like required class and kind of a, a formal program, right? Just so that people have that exposure. I think that'd be really neat. So I hope your secret mission. <laughs> a secret mission broadcast on the internet, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think uh, what surprised me the most was how difficult it is to make things truly reproducible. So. I think if you do some, if you have an analysis or something that's in one script, say one R script, one Python script, I don't think it's too difficult to ensure that someone else can take that script and run it. Uh, in the case of Shellcast, we had a lot of different components. So we had Python scripts, we have R scripts. Um, we're using Google Cloud Platform, and there were all of these different components that we have to get to work together. And then when it came time to start having other people put everything onto their own computers such that they could start working on the code, uh, making some changes, it wasn't as easy as just 
following step by step on GitHub. And there are all these things that came up along the way that we realized, oh, that's an issue. So this person has an older version of Python and now they're getting error messages. Or there were these dependencies for different packages that we hadn't realized because we've had those installed on our computers forever. And then someone else who's starting fresh doesn't have that on their computer. Um, so I think for me, what was surprising was just how difficult it was. <laughs> And we're still wrestling with that. Uh, we have not fully resolved all of those issues. That's still proving to be pretty difficult. Yeah, I think like echoing both Natalie and Sierra's like experience, I'm, I'm just thinking like in my position at the state climate office, like we had these multi-level soil moisture sensor probes that were like custom built by someone at the state climate office. And recently we had to like decommission them just because we there was no documentation or anything like to, you know, maintain them or rebuild them, you know, like, and we have acidic soils in North Carolina. So that does not play well with like any like man-made material that you put in the ground. So it was just like, they're going to degrade, but we don't have any way to reproduce like those sensors. So it's just like, well, now we have to just, now we can't have that multiple level sensor measurement for soil moisture. So yeah. It, and then, yeah, Natalie, like, yeah, like, you know, we're kind of still going through some of these issues and, and just also realizing like, I'm very grateful that we, um, and that you, you know, valued the time it took to do like the documentation and, and we were able to give uh, Stanton and I a lot of time like to dedicate that time to like document like Shellcat to get Shellcast up and running um, so that, you know, the person coming on after uh, Stanton left like could kind of spin up quick more quickly um, and then I also didn't have to like spend time in my new position uh, kind of like mentoring someone that was you know com this new web developer that was coming on so I think that was in the in hindsight it was surprising to me like how important that was and that it actually like saved us a lot of time even though it still is kind of like we were still seeing like there are some issues but yeah, that was surprising to me. Yeah. Um, and we also got a shout out from the reproducibility steering committee staff member will so thanks for joining in. Um, and yeah, it sounds like folks are having similar experiences with, you know, not being able to reproduce, you know, equipment or software and things like that. Um, so I, I think it seems like this chat is resonating with people so that's good to hear um and i hope we can keep the conversation going so we have seven minutes left so i kind of wanted to just leave a a bit of like open-ended discussion time at the end was there anything that you like definitely resonated with you during our chat today that you wanted to kind of like bring up again or or talk in more detail about uh micah do you want to start yeah, yeah, I want to start, but anything I want to say would take the next half hour. Um, I'm just really, um, uh, the thing that surpri surprised me and continues to encourage me is that you all are willing to take this risk, you know, as, as much as it is a risk in your careers to, to, to break boundaries and do new kinds of work. So um, you should know that librarians across the world are looking for and cheering for people like you because we we do a lot of work on the back end um, to try to make all this stuff more possible uh infrastructure policy community growth and development but it's it's this sort of work that you all are putting in and the time and effort that you're putting in that is um indications of the culture change that we are working for so i, I just like hanging out in the room with you yeah, I guess you and everyone else out there who are on that side of things definitely deserve a major shout out because this would not be possible without that kind of support and infrastructure and things like that. So it's cool to see these group efforts kind of 
come to fruition with these projects. Very exciting. Yeah. Natalie, did you want to say anything or anything specifically that resonated with you from today's chat? Well, I think what resonated was also just hearing about um, kind of what we each took away from the 10 simple rules article in terms of what we thought was particularly interesting. Um, and so I thought that was a, a nice discussion. I have one other idea of something that I kind of want to bring up because I'm curious to hear all your thoughts. So with this 10 simple rules article, it is going to an open access journal, right? Keeping with the theme of having everything open throughout this project. Uh, and it's expensive to publish there. And so I'm also curious to hear, uh, you know, I've noticed that open access fees have been going up. So I recall when I was in grad school budgeting about $1,500 to $2,000. And recently I've seen certain journals uh, requiring up to $4,000. And I know for some like nature, it's even higher. And I'm finding that difficult to keep up with and difficult to include in grant proposals. Uh, and so if there is a little bit of time, I'd be curious to hear what you all think about that. Because even with this publication expense, it is going to throw a little bit of a curveball with our um, budget. Well, I have very strong opinions and I'm not sure I want to broadcast on a Twitch stream about that. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's challenging. It's kind of like this, you're expected to do open science and put your work out there, but then you're also expected to pay for it and people are profiting off it. Yeah, I just think it's very interesting system. I think this problem is getting recognized, though. I think there's lots of folks who are maybe now more aware of the issue. And I've seen even on Twitter, like certain people boycotting certain journals and things like that. I don't know. So I think, I think the whole thing is going to have to be reconciled one way or another. I definitely don't know enough about the mechanics and how those companies operate to, you know, know what the best solution is, but I agree it can't sustainably, the cost of publishing open can't keep increasing like it has been and make putting research out there sustainable. So if you think something somewhere is probably going to have to change, but I just don't know what that is or should be. Yeah, I kind of feel the same way here. Like have opinions, but but it is interesting to to see like uh f like some of the big institutions in Europe are really pushing back against some of these publishers. So I've I've been like trying to pay attention to that those like news stories that pop up maybe i think see now it's like i'm not i have to tell you where i'm getting my information from and i just can't remember i think it was on twitter <laughs> um, but but it is interesting to like see you know people pushing back um or like the uh university of california system pushing back uh, with the publications uh open access publications and things like that with just saying like we're not gonna pay for this subscription anymore um so I, but yeah i don't know like i definitely don't have a solution even though my engineering self wants to be like how do we solve this problem i don't know other than the fact that we just don't publish in those journals um i guess that's what i've been thinking about but i still like when Pris push comes to show, but I don't know <laughs> uh, really what to do. Yeah. What do you think, Micah? Yeah, um, can I, can I have the last word? Yeah. Can I have the last <laughs> word for the, for the next 30 minutes? Um, th this is, is like the purpose of my job, basically, to figure that problem out. And so the, the historical challenge is that um, over 50 years, as journals went electronic, we gave all the control of that to corporations. So the corporations own the scholarly record right now. Um, and they raise prices whenever they want. And libraries who like, we are the ones that pay for that stuff. The library pays for that stuff. Our budgets either stay flat or decline. <laughs> um, so we make really hard decisions about what we can't buy anymore. 
in recent years, lots of libraries are experimenting with other ways to support scholarly publishing that includes, uh, like some places will set it, I, I think Duke has a fund, will set up a fund to pay article processing charges for people, but that fund is depleted really quickly when charges go from 1500 to 7k, right? Um, so some, there, there are lots of, um, possible solutions that are being tried out right now. Um, if, if I can, like the fact that we're having this conversation and that two assistant professors are, are, are saying this is a challenge is the most important thing. And continuing to say that more loudly and broadcast it on the internet and saying it in your departmental meetings, that's how we hope that culture will change. But it really does come, in, come down to um, how, how money flows in and out of universities from national funders through universities and then straight to publishers, which is uh, kind of sad. Um, let's see if I can end this on a positive note. I mentioned um, policy and community and um, sort of infrastructure work. Those are the three areas that, that I, I and folks like me are working in. All of those three areas have lots of momentum toward open and including um, funding. There's a group that I've mentioned on here before, the Open Research Funders Group, which is um, mostly uh, private philanthropies, um, not NSF and um, Department of Ag, um, but big, big money coming together and saying, hey, we're funding research that, that people can't read and the prices keep going up. We need to do something about this. So there's, um, there's, there's hope. Um, it, it will continue to be a challenge and um, I'm sorry for your, your research budget because I know you, like this is something you want to choose and it's hard to do that. Um, can I, okay, one more minute, oh no. Um, there are ways you can, there are ways you can do open without paying for it and I'm happy to talk to anyone about that anytime, forever and ever, amen. <laughs> yes, I, yeah, thanks for that hopeful end note. Like, uh, um, I do want to kind of close us out because we're already two minutes over and I don't want uh, Natalie and Sierra. To, I don't want to take up too much more of their time, but just I wanted to say a big thanks to all of you for joining and uh, talking about uh, reproducibility and open science and the paper that we're working on together. It's been a real pleasure to do that. Thank you, Claire, for moderating the chat and for helping us with the live stream. Yes, um, thanks. And yeah, thanks all. Thanks especially to Natalie and Sierra. Great to do this with you all. Yeah, thanks so much for the invite. This was fun. We have to do it again. All right, bye everyone. Take care. See ya. Yeah.